Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to Around the Peninsula. Right now I'm standing at one of the most famous places on the peninsula. I'm at the Vanderlip Estate in Portuguese Ben in Rancho Palos Verdes. And we're about to go inside the Villa Narcissa, built by the peninsula founder Frank Vanderlip. Inside we're going to meet up with two of the Vanderlip family members who are going to take us down memory lane and explain now why they've decided to put this historic and treasured property on the market. is for sale. Um, we're the same people we were before, um, but everybody's looking at us differently now. People are surprised if they don't know me well, but the people who do know me well know that his, this has been coming for a long time and that it's been thought out very carefully. Uh, and many, many discussions in the family have gone on for the last few years. It, and, and there's four of us. And, yeah. and if you asked the four of us separately, you get four, and you'll get you know different answers here. Um, it's a lot like you know the blind blind people with the elephant. Um, our mother died in 2009. I moved back here in 2010 to sit the place because 2010 you you couldn't sell it property. It was the middle of the recession, and so um, everybody had a different policy and. My policy was to, to roll up my sleeves and, and keep the place operating um, because we were going to sell it. And other, other siblings, they were going to just live here and you know, make it a vacation home or make it a museum or something like that. But I really haven't changed the way I look at the house. It's always been something to work at and something to operate. Um, keep all the tenants happy, keep the trees from growing like crazy take care of the water and, and everything else, because eventually we were going to move on. And um, so now, now we are. It really took, it took uh, uh, getting the family together more than anything else. To share what's here, there's 11 plus acres, and if you were to describe the property that's being listed right now. I don't know. And the villa is uh, 1926, and with uh, an older two-story part, and a newer wing, we're in what we call the playroom because in 1956, this part was added, one story part as a playroom designed by Cliff May, who was a, one of our, our father's best friends, the fa father of the California Ranch House. And um, then it was expanded and expanded as our mother's old age home so she wouldn't have to go upstairs. So it has an open kitchen and um, an office and so, and so forth. And then Around the house are the formal gardens that were originally uh, designed by the Olmsted brothers, but our mother did a lot of additions to that. And then there's the cypress alley that goes up to a colonnade, and up there is one of my favorite places is the amphitheater, an outdoor theater. And, and as you go farther from the house, the land becomes more natural, and until you're right outside the property and you're in the Land Conservancy. So because of the gardens that are manicured and the Land Conservancy, there's a huge amount of wildlife, of birds and butterfly species that you can't find anywhere else, and owls. and So it's a beautiful natural environment that kind of combines uh, man-made beauty and natural beauty. And then the view, which is incredible. And then the property goes down the hill too. There's a beautiful terrace and um, more cottages below the property. I mean, and a tennis court. The listing price for the house is twelve nine. Yeah, we came up with it after a tremendous amount of discussion. And um, in when um, our mother Ellen died, um, because we we weren't covered by Proposition 13. The, the county had the right to come in and reassess the property. And they instantly did so, and they gave us a, an assessment, a property tax based on $10 million, which wasn't any fun at all. And we, um, we, we uh, it's a long story, um, but it got reduced eventually. Um, but that was what they came up with in 2009. 
And so things have gotten a little better since then. Uh, and we've looked at a lot of other properties and talked to people who buy and sell property and 12.9 seemed to be good. Actually, uh, oddly enough, um, the feedback I get is, hey, this is a bargain. Why did, yeah. What did you do? The kinds of people who seem to be interested are uh, people who've already been through um, working with a large property before or who've come into some gigantic fortune and um, this is a wonderful way to spend it because it's not just buying the property, it's then operating the property and spending a lot of time trying to figure out how you would make it yours. You know, the, yeah. uh, the, my mom's way of making it hers was to hop in a helicopter and sit up there and look at the property and say, well, let's put the olive tree LA there and let's put the lemon trees and let's do the jacarandas. And so she actually designed it sort of like a, you know, a big formal garden where you would have the whole, whole thing laid out. And then she proceeded to build all of that. And uh, most of it's made it through the drought. Uh, her last words were, I planted too many trees, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. And your mom was about fun, and you you sort of carrying on that tradition. This is a great um, place to have a party, and uh, <laughs> Ellen, our mother, knew how to how to launch parties. So, and she, her boyfriend of forty five years, um, was uh, totally connected to Hollywood. So, a tremendous number of of Hollywood royalty came down here. Um, she was in the Norwegian resistance and worked for the King of Norway in London during the Blitz. So, we had the King of Norway who incidentally wanted to make sure that Merle Oberon would come to lunch too. And he sat next to Merle Oberon. He was very happy about that. Um, and we've had Kennedys and all, all kinds of stuff have, have come through here. So if you, if you think about operating this as a, as a social platform, as a status platform, um, it, it really works out very, very well it, because it's yeah. unique. It, it's, it's great. My mother, if she would read about somebody interesting when she read about uh, an architect that she admired very much, the one who designed the, the Cerritos Performing Arts Center and the, uh, the Children's Institute. And she just called him up and invited him down. And he came down because people want to see the house. And if you have a fundraiser, it's like the best because either they've already been here and they want to come back or they've never been, they've heard about it. And this is just a fantastic place for a party. And on a sidebar, this this home is, has helped raise so much money for community yes. causes. Yeah. Yeah. So there have been all kinds of parties. One of my favorites is when we had the, uh, the firemen, the fire stations up to, for dinner. Or my mom used to have them for drinks because they've been so wonderful to p protecting the property over the years when there have been threats. So. Can we talk a little about the history? I know you've done this a lot over the years. We've had you on TV here telling us the stories, but just just go back and talk about your grandfather and just sort of the story about Frank Vanderlip and how this all came to be. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if you want to do uh, a career study, he, he's an interesting guy. He, he made um, six, six job changes and he went from basically being a dirt poor farmer who had been evicted, evicted from the farm because they lost it at a bank sale to being head of Citibank and being invited by the Japanese government to meet all the dukes and spending time in St. Petersburg and opening branches in Paris and London. Those branches are still there. Um, it was, it was uh, tremendous. He was a hardworking son of a gun. And the way, he, the way he claims he did it is by working very hard and attaching himself to people who knew how things worked. So he, he became more and more involved with uh, with different levels of society, really. And he was taught how to behave and how to converse and how to dance and um, worked his way through Washington and then New York and then all over, all over the world, wrote books and the like. And uh, there was a, a great financial crisis in 1908, a liquidity crisis. And so he and a group of other investors bought property around the country, near a port where there's railroads and a city and they bought five of those uh, and this was one of the properties that they bought. Um, th the First World War came along, 1916, his partner said, well, this has been a lot of fun but we want to cash out. So he bought them out of this property and um, then he spent the next uh, sort of 21 years um, trying to figure out what to do with it uh, and as a result of that we have Palos Verdes Estates and we have 
beautiful bridal trails and rolling hills and everything, you know, is sort of seems to be, have some kind of design to it. It's a little different than other parts of Los Angeles. Uh, and, and then our father took up that Yeah, also. took the mantle. But when he got married, my grandparents had helped each of their kids get their starter house. So this was their starter house. He also was uh, president of the family corporation and he helped develop, or he did develop Portuguese band, Long Hills Estates, and um, also helped, you know, with the Wayfarers Chapel and various other projects. Portuguese Band Club. Portuguese Band, the Riding Club. Uh, and he created the Beach Club. Right. So that's great. So the 8,000 acres was sold back in the, in the 50s. And uh, we kept about 450 acres. And it was called Filiorum. And it basically went from um, Del Cerro Park down to Abalone Cove, both sides of this property. And so we had to run that 440 acres, and it was uh, there were a lot more rental places back then. Um, the farmstead, agriculture, the whole thing. It was a huge amount of work and um, very high taxes. We were I mean, we were basically working for taxes. And then the um, that 440 acres was sold off, and what was left is just. The, the three properties up here. It's just shrunk, 16,000 acres, 8,000 acres, 400 acres, and now we're down to 11 acres. And, uh, but 11 acres is a lot. Right? So the, bring, bring us back to your memories in growing up here. We grew up here when it was just a, a, a great place to be a kid because there wasn't anything around. There was no development at all. There's no Hawthorne Boulevard, no nothing. And um, so we, we played and ran around a lot. That was terrific. And then every so often, once or twice a year, this huge, Massive men and horses would come riding onto the property. The Rancheros Visitadores, or probably mispronounced it, but it was a social organization and they would ride around Santa Inez and Santa Barbara. And they'd come down here and ride around the peninsula. And um, that was, it was a very impressive group. Uh, our father died and uh, our mother decided to go overseas for a while because being here by herself wasn't terrific. And so we all lived overseas for eight years, came back in 1966, and, um, and then basically all scattered to the wind. For someone that's going to come walk through this house as a possible buyer, and you're taking them on tour, kind of share some of the highlights. There's, it's got some dynamite rooms in the other part, in the old part, um, with uh, you know, ceilings and high, it, it, they, you really get a sense of history when you walk into those rooms because they were built in the 20s and they're still absolutely intact. So the old part of the house feels like you're, you know, you're, you're living in a, in a his, sort of a historical area. And the uh, big fireplaces, you go out onto a terrace that looks straight out over Catalina. So you're up at about 550 feet, so you've got a, a great view. And uh, in the summer, it gets pretty hot around here. You know, we're in Los Angeles. Um, but part of the, uh, her tree planting operation, um, my mother built this fantastic shade area over the terraces. And uh, we have a lot of parties right over there on the terrace. And uh, you cannot get people to go home. And what you do is you walk people up to the top. So we're at 550 feet, but the, the temple up there is about almost 800 feet up. How many and steps? 269. 68 beautiful our, our grandfather brought some, um, some people he met in Italy over as, as furniture manufacturers. And a lot of the furniture in this house was manufactured right here in in. Uh, he started in a little PV. furniture factory. Right, and if you go to Malaga Cove Library, you see exactly the same furniture that we have here because it was all done by the same guys at about the same time. Some um, quite a number of family portraits in the house of uh, my grandfather and his sister and um, older generations than that. So it's, it's kind of nice to have all that around. And, um, our mother Ellen was an incredible scrapbook producer. So she kept everything from everything. Um, there's literally probably 800 pounds of scrapbooks in this house and boxes of photographs and the like. And we're having a wonderful time going through all of that and reminiscing. I thought, told you I was going to ask each of you to have sort of a favorite spot or memory to share of just being here. Yep. Well, as you came in from the driveway, you go between two gardens, and um, there used to be a tree there that is no longer. And uh, but it had uh, wonderful branches that were just the right size for a five-year-old to climb. And so that was my tree. I climbed that tree. Spent a lot of time in the tree. 
And then you fast forward, you go forward about 70 years, well, not 70, 65 years, and uh, it's my dog's favorite spot. The tree's not there, but when the dog comes into the, to the house, he goes straight to where the tree was and just plunks down in the ivy and he's happy. Well, one of mine was probably uh, the playhouse that was uh, given to us when you were six and I was five years old. And it's a miniature of the house with the same arched windows, like the front, the same front door, and the same mismatched chimneys on top. What about the whole thing with the peacock? Is, did uh, Frank Vanderlip bring the peacock here, or did someone give it to him? It was a him? big conspiracy by that. the Vanderlips to destroy Palos Verdes by introducing <laughs> peacocks, and we succeeded. <laughs> well, he had, a, he had a, um, a whole bird farm down here, so he had several hundred different and, kinds of birds and lots of cages, and go ahead. And his friend Lucky Baldwin gave him I always heard four pairs, my sister says five pairs, whatever, eight or ten peacocks, and one pair of albino white peacocks. And when he gave his bird collection away after the, the crash, he gave his bird collection to Mr. Wrigley and Catalina, and uh, until recently there was an aviary over there with the descendants of our grandfather's birds, but he kept the peacocks, and the two white ones did not survive, but the the eight or ten peacocks multiplied, and that's who lives all over. So there's the two of you here with me now, and then you have your brother Hendrik and Katrina, and mm -hmm. Katrina is well known in the community because she's done a lot with her art, and yeah. she set up the Vanderlip um, Heritage Foundation. She created this foundation to preserve the legacy, and uh, she was recently here, and she had meetings with the mayor of uh, our Palos Verdes Estates and the mayor, the new mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes. And both of them were very receptive to the idea of creating a space, uh, <coughs> like a Vanderlip room, where people could see what it was like to live here in the 20s and hear the history. We have a lot of artifacts that, that could go there. And um, so that was very exciting. And the, uh, Dan Burchett of the Wayfarers Chapel uh, reached out to me after reading an article in the paper and he was up here yesterday talking about what they could do to, to preserve the Vanderlip legacy as, as it connects to the Wayfarers Chapel. So all that's yeah. very exciting and the archives, you know, we'll figure out where they, they could go. So that's all really, really good news and that I think it'll make parting easier knowing that there were, you know, people, because we don't know who buys this, if they want total privacy or if they'll continue the tradition of making the house available to the community and for fundraising and political events and gardening events and theater and concerts and all the things that you can do here. What would your grandfather think? Everybody still wants a piece of him in a sense. I mean, there's... I think the more I, I've been researching both my grandparents the last couple of years with a, a, a collaborator, and one of the, the, every time we work together, we discover more and more things that both my grandparents, Frank and Narcissa did. And they were both very good at getting publicity for the things that they cared about. But neither of them cared about publicity for themselves. They're not famous. They're not famous all over the world or whatever. And uh, so, I think they'd be surprised that there, that there was this interest in them. Mm -hmm. But because they both were very principled people, very generous people, as my, my grandfather said, I didn't care about yachts and champagne. You know, they, they were interested in education and beauty and, I mean, they funded scholarships, they helped create schools from Tokyo to Istanbul and bring students from Russia to America. I mean, they, they just did so many things. There's a, uh, it, it's nice to, to uh, it's a wise man that knows his father, somebody said. Uh, and so it's, it helps to know your father and your grandfather and grandmother. They did a lot of wonderful things. I've learned more about them as time's gone by. Vicki Mack wrote that great book. Um, uh, Katrina's done a lot of research and um, so it, it, it's interesting. It, the house and the Vanderlips are different. You know, the house is the house. It has, really, anybody could live here, anybody could use it. Um, but for us personally, as a family, um, having some idea of where we came from and, and all that was accomplished is, is, is satisfying. We have 
thousands of photographs of the property from when it was started. You know, we we can write about it, and uh, my sister does beautiful watercolors, and she's been doing watercolors of places on the property that she loves, and all of us have our memories, and I think, you know, everybody will be all right. We'll each have little pieces of this, of this house in our own homes, in our own worlds, and that'll make us happy and bring us joy. I think, it'll, I think we'll all be okay. Only time will tell what happens next for the Vanderlip property, but the Vanderlip legacy will live on for generations to come. And there's more to come here on Around the Peninsula. We're going to travel right up the coast to the Terranea Resort, where we're going to join in the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce for their annual economic breakfast. Stay with us. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back to Around the Peninsula. I'm here at Terranea with the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce as they hold their annual economic forecast breakfast. They're going to have a presentation by Dr. Christopher Thornburg, a leading U.S. economist who has come to let us know what he sees the economy will look like in 2020. This is actually the sixth year we have done this event. It is sold out every year. It brings together our business leaders, our government leaders, and our community leaders, and it's a kickoff for the new year. So in this case, a kickoff for the new decade. We are very honored to once again have Christopher Thornburg, who is the founding partner of Beacon Economics, as our keynote speaker. And he will really give us a very pragmatic, business-oriented outlook for 2020 um, at the national, state, and uh, local level. It isn't going to be a lot different than last year, which is interesting because we've been told over the last year about how things are going to be changing. Uh, we've heard about the downturn that's about to occur. We've heard about real estate meltdowns, all the horror stories of trade wars. Reality is, U.S. economy still doing fine, plugging along at a nice steady pace. Lots of good indicators of good things happening right now in our economy, not just nationally, but right here inside California. But with all that good economic news, that has to be layered, of course, on top of all the insanity in the political world. You know, I like to say I'm a great economic forecaster, but I'm a terrible political forecaster because every year I keep coming here and going, it can't get crazier, and it gets crazier. Well, this year, of course, we're running up that 2020 election. Um, the, the, level of hysteria is already beyond the pale at this particular point in time. And you know, the scary thing here is we have so much momentum. We have such economic opportunity right now, and it seems as if we're, we're just hell-bent on squandering it. Um, whether that's actually dealing with the supply crisis for housing here in California, getting serious about fiscal reform that we need in the long term, or national questions about the national debt, where we're completely making the situation worse rather than better by blowing out the budget when in fact we ought to be figuring out how to fix Social Security and Medicare for the long run. The average family out there, do you think they're going to end up with more money in their bank accounts this year? How's their financial future looking? Absolutely better, right? If you look at whether it's, you're talking about um, incomes, which are rising across the board, particularly for low-skilled folks, if you're looking at um, the job opportunities out there, you have a, a whole crop of kids getting opportunities to get into labor force like they've never seen before. Uh, in a very real sense, the vast majority of Americans are going to be better off than they were last year. There's no doubt about it in my mind. There's so many opportunities today. Yes, we've heard a lot about, you know, the, how Amazon's taking over the world. By the way, last decade was Google, and the decade before that it was the Microsoft. There's always somebody telling us about some corporation that's going to take over everything. It's all nonsense. The biggest problem small businesses are going to face is labor shortages. And in fact, you know, today we have a little special treat. Uh, I have some data from a survey that some of my folks at my company have done to talk about the challenges that mid-sized businesses face in this particular labor market and a little bit about how they have to adapt in order to make sure that you can continue to create their workforce tomorrow. 
anything else you want to share? Any takeaways you want? If it's the most important thing this group can walk away with today? Just hang up the miserabilism. Let's appreciate how good we have it and then focus on the things we need to achieve. The passion of Christopher Thornburg and the viability and the efficacy of this man is paramount. The fact that we can get him here for our local Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce and our community is, um, again, helps to put this place on the map. What brings you back every year for the economic breakfast? Well, the Chamber does such a good job, and being a realtor for now 40 years this month, in Palos Verdes South Bay. I just want to keep on top of everything for my clients and just for my own edification. It's important. It's a new decade. 2020, it will be the best. We are so excited to host the economic breakfast once again. It's really a powerful way to start our year in the business community and we're very excited. And I know you sit on the chamber board. Why do you do that? Why is it so important to be involved like this for you here at Terranea? Thank you. The Chamber does important work in the legislative arena in helping us grow our business, particularly our small businesses here on the Hill. So we're very excited to be a partner and a Chairman Circle member of the Chamber. Tell me about some exciting things that are happening here at the resort. Well, we're very excited. We crossed over, which is a term to say how many rooms do we have on the books for this year. And we crossed over at our goal. Matter of fact, we even exceeded it a bit. So it's going to be a robust year. There's a lot happening, a lot of programming. We have some renewedness in our recreation program. Lots of things happening out on the water. And our restaurants are all working on menus, seasonal menus, fresh products from our farm. So there's there's a lot happening. How would you describe the business climate in RPV in, in terms of and how healthy it is right now? I mean, generally speaking, it is healthy. I mean, but there's always room for growth and there's always room for improvement. And I think the city and the city council, that is always going to be a top priority for them to, to help businesses grow. And because when the businesses grow and they flourish, so does the city. We benefit from it as well. In terms of benefits, here we are at Terranera Resort, an economic powerhouse for RPV. Explain what the, what, what the dollars mean that come out of here. No, it's very important. I mean, when Terranea succeeds, like I said, the city succeeds as well and those revenues come we get the transient occupancy tax and that helps a lot of um the capital improvement projects in the city so the residents benefit from terranea benefiting overall um everybody's very optimistic about business on the peninsula business is growing uh, we're bringing in more businesses we are actually building here on the peninsula you know i'm up in the central business district of rolling hills estates and there's construction all around us and things are growing and booming uh, I think people are concerned about housing. Uh, we are actually here on the peninsula building more affordable housing for elderly people, which is really great. And then for people who want to stay here on the peninsula as they uh, get older and need a little more care, there's housing available for them. So I think we're addressing a lot of those needs. Congratulations to the Chamber for another sellout event. If you're interested in becoming a member or want more information, you can log on to palaceverdeschamber.com. I'm Liz Brown Swanson with Around the Peninsula. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.